I am really so very pleased to be founding editor of this journal and leading a multidisciplinary group of over 60 researchers on the editorial team, advisory board, and editorial board. Along with the team at SAGE, a large number of people therefore have invested and dedicated their time to making this journal happen. In introducing the journal, I think it's probably worth noting that the most debated aspect of big data seems to be the meaning and definition of the term. For some commentators, it is not scientific enough, or it's underdetermined, it's buzzy, overhyped, and so on. But one reason we've taken it up is that it is active, controversial, and it's happening across numerous communities of practice, including the computing industry, popular media, business, and government, and of course, the many disciplines of the academy. And for sure, while there is some boosterism and hype to be found, there's also a lot of healthy skepticism about claims that big data is the new magic bullet that can solve the problems of the world. But just as the grand claims need to be tempered, so too do the counterclaims. I think both tend to overgeneralize and veer between big data as the answer to everything or nothing. Yet while these generalizations are proliferating, big data is indeed being defined and taken up as we speak by innumerable institutional and individual practices and investments on the part of governments, for example, or corporations, and certainly academic research funders and centers and projects of various kinds. But there is a really important second reason for adopting the term. For one, it is a happening and it's working across various uses and there is no settlement on a definition and this leaves open a space for engaging creatively with it. So even though one of the most buzzy of all definitions is often appealed to, what is now variously referred to as the three V's of volume, velocity, and variety, there really is little agreement about what these terms specifically mean. Therefore, in launching this journal, we are not seeking to really provide or settle on a definition, but instead to leave it open as an object of debate, disagreement, and contestation. To do this, we start with the proposition that what is big about big data, perhaps, is that it involves changing practices that are reconfiguring the relations we have to data, and that these have big consequences for societies. Whether we think of online platforms or digital devices, we know they are changing our everyday practices of communicating, and they are also instantiating new forms of sociality, of politics, of identity, and of social relations. Yet, and at the same time, these everyday practices are generating data that are leading to new method relations as the data is variously repurposed and assembled and analyzed by individuals, corporations, by governments, and of course researchers in the academy. In these ways, what we are witnessing are also new data relations, or what we could say new relations to data that are becoming important and part of everyday lives and vocabularies as various publics learn about how they're made into data and also come to work with data themselves. In these various ways, big data in society seeks to move beyond those usual notions of big data and treats it as an emerging field of practices that is not defined by, but actually generative of sometimes novel data qualities, such as high volume and granularity and also complex analytics such as data linking and data mining. Now it is towards understanding these data practices that we are providing a space for contributions that analyze those practices, but also that involve empirical engagements and also experiments with innovative methods, while also at the same time reflecting on the consequences for societies, for how they are known, how they are being made, and how societies are being governed. To provide such a space for these debates and exchanges, we are first and foremost an open access and digital only journal. And secondly, unlike most journals, we are going beyond the traditional peer-reviewed research article to include a section on commentaries, especially for submissions from non-academic authors, and also one for essays by early career researchers about how they have taken up questions of big data in their research. Additionally, we're also linking the journal content to a website with a number of different multimedia features. We have video interviews with authors of recent and relevant books, video abstracts and blogs on the journal content, and soon a demonstration section that will curate and comment on projects related to particular themes concerning big data for societies. However, I'd like to note that this is just the start of the journal. 
Over time, we will introduce more functionality and links between content, blogs, and videos, as well as article metrics and alt metrics. Additionally, we are working on making our banner design an interactive and dynamic visualization of the journal, and specifically its keywords, to provide both an alternative way of navigating content, as well as a way to watch how the journal is active in defining the key concepts and concerns about big data for societies. A few words on our first volume. The contributions are really key positioning papers, especially for setting what I would call the context for current debates on big data by putting them critically into historical context. For example, Rob Kitchen, in his article, Big Data, New Epistemologies and Paradigm Shifts, critically engages with the rise of new forms of empiricism as a result, particularly, of big data and new data analytics. Basically, he argues that we are witnessing the unfolding of a data revolution that is much like other revolutions in science that have been preceded by revolutions in measurement. He takes up what this means for social scientific knowledge today and calls for the development of a situated, a reflexive, and contextually nuanced epistemology. Joining Rob Kitchen's article is one by Trevor Barnes and Matthew Wilson, who write on big data, social physics, and spatial analysis. Interestingly, they also challenge claims about big data that sever it, especially from its long and complicated past. It's a past tangled up with the histories of computerization, of superpower weaponry and defense strategies, of military funding, commercialization and advertising, corporatization, government regulation, epistemological fashion and debate, and also academic uh, disciplinary research agendas. But rather than attempting to detail all of these really complex histories, they focus on what they call one antecedent of big data, that of social physics, as it was taken up especially by geographers in the 1950s. In particular, they connect contemporary practices of exploratory data analysis, of pattern recognition, data mining, prediction, modeling, and intelligence and design to an earlier spatial analysis in social physics. Now, Sabina Leonelli also explores how the meaning, histories, and future of big data are specific to fields of practice, and she especially exemplifies this in relation to experimental biology in her article, What Difference Does Quantity Make? Interestingly, she argues that quantity actually is not the key factor that is distinguishing big data science today. As she notes, many sciences, of course, have a long history of dealing with large quantities of data. What Leonelli argues is significant is the change in valuation of data as a commodity and the practices that are developed to handle and to curate data, such as methods, such as infrastructures, technologies, skills and knowledge that are really key, as she says, determinants of novelty and of new discoveries. Through the concept of data journeys, she calls on analyses that follow how data are actually being disseminated and being used to generate knowledge. And finally, in a fourth research article, Nigel Thrift in his provocative special feature article, The Sentient City and What It May Portend, argues that sociality today is turning into something that is being augmented by myriad information and communication technologies and the related data-rich materials that are pervasive, that are constantly evolving in durable parts of modern city life. He argues that this complex entanglement of humans and non-human forces are actually giving cities their own forces of energy, of tenacity and magnetism, and providing for the emergence of a city that actually starts to become aware of itself as an entity, but most importantly, aware of its existence as an emergence. So rather than analyzing this sentience as a servant of the security entertainment complex as it's sometimes known and called, he looks to technical artistic interventions to speculate about what cities might actually look and feel like in 50 years time, when we have data rich materials and they have become embedded in lives and have begun to take on the character of what he calls emerging urban spirits. These research articles are um, accompanied by three commentaries. The first is by Roger Burrows and Mike Savage, and they reflect on their 2007 article on the coming crisis of empirical sociology, which was written at a time when the term big data actually had not yet really made its way into the discipline of sociology, 
Yet now, in retrospect, they know it was indeed the phenomenon alluded to in their polemic. Their well-known piece is accompanied by two contributors from outside the academy. First, we have Prabhakar Raghavan from Google on the challenges of scaling up what he describes the science in social science. Additionally, we have Peter Struz, Bartel Praxma, and Piet Daz from Statistics Netherlands on the implications of big data for official statistics. And then finally, in what we call our Early Career Researcher Forum, Brooke Foucault-Wells reflects on her research and makes the case for choosing to examine what she calls small subsets of big data as a way in particular to study minorities and statistical outliers. I am so very thrilled to have all of these contributions in the launch of the journal, and over the coming weeks we will be publishing content that further challenges our thinking and understanding of big data. For example, coming up soon, we will have articles published by David Lyon on contemporary conundrums of surveillance, especially in the time of Snowden and the kinds of releases of big data that are surrounding that controversy. Lev Manovich will be reflecting on what constitutes big data in the case of interactive media. And then Lynette Taylor and researchers from the Oxford Internet Institute will be writing on big data analysis and economics. And finally, Tommaso Venturini and researchers from the Media Lab at Sciences Po are writing on three common misunderstandings about digital methods in relation to the digital tracing and the textual analysis of climate change negotiations. These research articles will be accompanied by commentaries from Alex Taylor and others at Microsoft Research on data and the street. Additionally, Nick Coldry and Alison Powell will comment on big data from the bottom up. And finally, in our Early Career Researcher Forum, we have an essay by Heather Ford on collaborations between ethnographers and data.